Good afternoon and welcome to Homework Live. This is Desiree Dubois, founder of Homework. And that's where you can live where you work, work where you live, anywhere in the world. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Linda Holst. She's the president of Vision Marketing Group. And they specialize in business development, strategic marketing, issue resolution, business consultant for growth and expansion, as well as an interim CFO. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Oh, lovely. It's <laughs> lovely. a beautiful day, and I uh, am delighted to speak with you today. Well, it's just fascinating when as I speak with you, every time I've spoken to you, I find more and more and more about what you do, your experiences, and the exposure that you've had to so many different types of businesses in different capacities, as well as your personal love and passion for horses. Just tell us a little bit about that, because that's so unique. I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, that industry or that specific position exists. I rode horses as a child, never owned a horse. And then all of a sudden in the year 2000, thought I'd get a horse. And because my profession's business development and marketing, I came across a breed. It was the Brazilian national horse, the Mangalarga Marchador breed, that was being newly introduced to America. And I ended up purchasing a beautiful, gorgeous stallion, um, and he's my best friend. But we introduced this breed in this culture, this Brazilian culture, horse culture, to the Western United States with just one horse. And through my love of the breed and the Brazilian people, and then I've had the privilege to go to their farms and conduct importing programs and bring uh, horses of this breed and market them to most of the equestrian community. However, there's a lot of older adults who want to pursue passion, and this is like having a sporty new car. <laughs> it's a unique horse, a sporty horse. <laughs> That's a fascinating. That wasn't that long ago, 19 years. You've learned a lot, you've been a lot, and you've really truly you've trenched, you know, got your, trenched yourself into that. I've, I've become a breeder. And wow. I, work, I have a breeding program with a Brazilian uh, farm that's located in Ocala, Florida. Just had a brand new little colt, 4th of July. Oh. He's adorable. And uh, just slowly introducing and marketing the breed because they are a joy. Is and there a lot of interest here in America? They're rare. They're about 350 in numbers. They're mostly unknown. But once somebody sees one, they really like them and they're attracted to them. They're uh, good companions, they're intelligent, they're sensible, and they can do almost everything um, multi-disciplines. So if you want to go on trail, you want to have a saddle horse, um, you want to go on endurance, they're very acclimated and willing to do those disciplines. You know, I find, not only find that fascinating that you, again, incorporate in your life, but I think the message is to people that a lot of people do have a passion, you know, and if something and they've never did it, they die with that passion. And you actually took the time and made the investment and find the time in your busy schedule to do that. So, you know, congratulations to you. Oh, thank you. And it is starting from zero. You don't have to have any foundation for your passion. Uh, I was not proficient and grew into uh, being a proficient uh, equestrian and breeder. Fantastic. So. Exciting, exciting. So the other part of your exciting life is building, developing, and uh, this help us just supporting business and exploding in a multiple different ways. Exactly. Well, you might call me a, a problem solver, yeah. an issue <laughs> resolver. <laughs> Um, I provide a lot of counsel and guidance to business owners. Uh, my background is uh, pretty multifaceted and broad. I have marketed uh, as a director of marketing multiple uh, trade shows through a trade show company, which introduced me to a lot of industries. And having been a business owner myself, I do identify some of the core business issues that small business owners face and larger businesses too normally it's summarized in one word cash <laughs> lack of cash <laughs> yay, yay. 
So it doesn't matter if you're a startup looking for initial funding, investors, or uh, one of my uh, client companies already raised $17 million, friends and family, and had to do other private offerings, and then how do they manage their cash flow, especially when they're not producing uh, revenue. So I do work with startups, anything from dot com. Let me say what I exclude. I exclude tech, not really high tech or biotech, um, but most other businesses, they all have a common best business practices that they can rely on and probably have some shortfalls. So are you able to go into a company and in what period of time are you able to look at their operations or their books and assess what's needed and what the next steps would be? I can usually make recommendations between 30 and 45 days. It depends on how broad the business is and what we're actually looking at. If we're looking at the way a president or the um, executive group conducts the business, it, they normally know their own problems. So we're able to identify uh, avenues to resolve it. And then if I'm putting in best practices, maybe you don't have a current employee manual, you're having issues with HR, uh, you might have legal compliance issues, then that might uh, take, you know, 60 days or the length of the case. But generally within four to six months, you know, you have a clear idea of what do you need to do? Do you need to have funding? Do you need to put in uh, employee um, safeguards? Whatever it is, it's been identified. As well as licensing issues and things, permits and things of that type? Yes, a lot of compliance. A lot of people and companies don't know they're out of compliance. And compliance has become very strict in uh, California. Uh, you have OSHA, you have HR with your um, EDD, your payroll, what can you do, what can't you do. Um, most companies have some employees that don't quite fit in, but then you have to handle it a certain way to meet compliance. And uh, generally, that's a gray area or hard to navigate area. The owner of the business or the executives involved, they have um, invested emotions. Um, they have firm opinions. And so I act as a facilitator to try to get these uh, issues resolved and maybe fill in the shortfalls especially with um, OSHA, HIPAA, you know, different federal compliance. You know, I think a lot of uh, business owners, whether they're large or small, don't realize how critical that is to the survival of their business because any one of those violations or citations could take them out of business. And that is absolutely true. You get a fine, mm -hmm. you have to hire an attorney, and um, sometimes it's not even you and without your knowledge, it might be your employees. So for example, I have a medical client, we keep a strict eye on how everybody handles uh, everything pertaining to medical and that we can make uh, meet all the compliance all the time. And it's, a, and it's not something that an active uh, founder or executive or president should be handling because they have other other positions, I mean other responsibilities, so that is something they really should invest in bringing someone off-site, on-site yes. to be able to handle for them, because it's not, it's not one of those things they should be doing. And many times they don't even know, they don't know the laws themselves, they don't know what's required and not required, they don't know, they, many times they're breaking the law, they that don't know that. That is true. I think we come from an entrepreneurial mindset where we think that uh, grow as you go, mm -hmm. and that you might not be the one that needs to do these things, but my philosophy is is that yes, the owner of the company, the key executives, they really do need to know. And not knowing is not a good enough excuse in most uh, issues, especially legal. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times they say you should have known. Exactly. Or what did you know and when did you know it? So what is critical is that the uh, entrepreneurial owner doesn't dodge certain areas. It might be financial, uh, not monitoring cash flow, and then all of a sudden they're in a bind and they're desperate for uh, financing. Or they weren't aware 
that there were certain OSHA requirements and their employees don't have a proper desk or chair and all you need is a whistleblower that can cause your uh, business some problems. And then another thing you do is with part of your issue resolution is that when someone does have a legal issue, you support them in providing the documents or the documentation that the attorney needs, minimizing their legal costs. Yes, I call it heavy lifting. <laughs> so when I interview an attorney firm and help the owner of the business select the type of attorney, uh, I'm very thorough as to what kind of service they provide and what the add-on expenses are. So usually I will tell the attorney that I can be their paralegal. I'll do the heavy lifting, give me the list of what you need to know, I'll gather it up and provide it to you so that we can um, control the costs and make sure that the meter isn't running for unnecessary phone calls, emails, and things like that. So outside of that, we were discussing about, you say you prepare people for their loans or for SBA loans or looking at their numbers and so forth. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, most companies have had a loan. They're either borrowing from their credit cards, they're taking a loan off their line of credit for their home, they're um, borrowing from relatives. Most companies do need to start their business with a loan and may not have adequate capital. And what happens is they max out and then all of a sudden you're trying to apply for a small business loan or you need a, a larger line of credit from some of your vendors and your credit starts to dip or you just don't have room. So if you're a startup or a do-over, uh, or push the reset button, which I like to say, let's press the reset button. What you want to do is plan your capital needs, where you are, and then present your company in a fashion that invites a lender's confidence, that makes a lender confident that you are worthy of their loan and that they will get paid back. So with the SBA loan, which means that the government will uh, guarantee the loan. Most banks do SBA loans. It does not mean once you pay off a SBA loan that the bank will lend you more money. I've come to find that out for uh, companies. And so then you have to seek other avenues. The biggest problem I run into that companies don't identify early enough is monitoring their cash flow and managing how they pay their bills, how their uh, vendors are set up, uh, so that they constantly are in a, a positive or at least have a flow to run their business. Sometimes they just run out of money. And is that part of your duties as an interim CFO? Yes, as an executive advisor or in the role of a CFO, I always take a look at the debt burden and also uh, how the company is managing their cash flow. A lot of times it points back to the owner and how the owner manages money. Uh, it's easy if you're successful to think you're rich. <laughs> and once you adopt a lifestyle and then you start cutting, you know, whether it's tax payments or hiring or skimping, you, you get yourself in a position where um, you find yourself in a lot of debt and unable to get the resources you need. So it's digging out of the hole. <laughs> digging out of the hole. So it's a business consultant and it's working with businesses as far as growth expansion. I heard you say that you help them put their policies and procedures together, their employee manuals together. Um, I would find it be really helpful when a business, like for example, we're wanting to expand and we want to expand different, um, different areas, territories. So being able to put everything in those documents, those manuals, those things that, again, a owner or founder or key executive person don't have the time, and sometimes don't even have the wherewithal to do all of that because they don't have those touch points. Do you do that as well? I do. I do uh, franchising documents, mm. you know, for uh, franchising <clears throat> agreements, and that incorporates uh, executive summaries, business plans, and a lot of times it will lead to employee manuals because if you want to duplicate your business, you do need to standardize your policies. And the sooner you get policies, maybe you only have two employees. What's interesting nowadays is 
We assume that everybody has common sense. We assume that everybody has manners or uh, will follow what would be a typical policy. What I've found is many people need it in writing and you do want every single employee to sign off that they are um, aware, they're responsible, and that they've, they know what the company policies are. And that translates into your human resources, um, unemployment issues, the personnel side, the human capital, if you will. Same with your consultants, your 1099s. You want to make sure you have uh, a good agreement and that you know exactly what they're going to uh, provide and what maybe you have to provide. So most of the companies that you work with, you mentioned your sweet spot were those that were under two million. So those really could some described as a startup somewhat, or as you mentioned, a reset. Yes, um, they want growth and expansion, mm -hmm. and they want to get over certain benchmarks for funding. A lot of times, investors won't even look at a company under a million dollars. So generally, getting over the million dollar hump and clear up as far as you can to two million uh, requires a lot of uh, resets, putting in place policies, monitoring uh, your business practices. And that is an area where I feel, um, I guess if you want to say gratification or feel success I'm proud of, is when I see a company flourishing or at least they know what they need to do and they have a plan to do it. So um, even if you're a business failure, there's usually something we can fix or turn around, but I have had businesses who have had to file Chapter 7 bankruptcy or Chapter 11 uh, bankruptcy, and so I'm well versed with um, personal and business bankruptcy. And that's one of the areas I do heavy lifting. <laughs> so, Well, it sounds exciting. You are relaunching some of your programs and your availability mm -hmm. to different businesses. What is your perfect avatar? and how is the best way for you to work, and how can they contact you? That's wonderful. Well, I personally like the old-fashioned way of contact. That's a, that's a phone call, but they can also contact me by email. Um, my perfect idea is just to have a willing company, a uh, owner that really wants to uh, be successful, so that when we put together a plan, I can feel confident that they're going to give it their best effort. And as far as uh, my sweet spot, I love consulting with owners and uh, CEOs, executives. Uh, I feel like that is sometimes an area where they don't have enough support. Um, so I would say that's probably the area that I like the most. Fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Most importantly for be here, being there to support people in business, men and women alike. And especially at that early stage, because I know that it's very rewarding, but it can be also very frustrating. So thank you for being there. And I want to thank our viewers, for those who are watching us. This has been Desiree from Homework and Linda Holst, who is the president of Vision Marketing Group. And until we meet again, stay empowered.